the 2020 ISCN um, Excellence Awards. Um, so we will start today with the Culture Change for Sustainability Award. This award recognizes an outstanding project or campaign that contributes to the sustainable campus that instills a culture of sustainability into the university's mission, the educational experience, the residential life, or the local community. Um, and it is my pleasure to present the 2020 Culture Change for Sustainability Award to um, Thomas Thott University. The award will be, expect, will be accepted by Prina. And Prina, you can help me with your last name. Um, but Prina is the Vice Rector for Sustainability at Rangsit Campus Administration. And please enjoy his presentation on how Thomasat University reduced single-use plastics on campus. Um, that is a very hot topic for all of us, so thank you. So before we go into um, Prinya's presentation, I'd like to share with you the video um, from Thomasat um, summarizing their project. Okay, Prinya, it's over to you. Prinya, you're on mute. 
and put that. Yes. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, uh, Heather. Uh, thank you for award from SCN for personal change for sustainability award. Uh, although uh, the audience uh, could not hear the sound of the clip, but the content is already have to be seen. And I would like to explain more in some details what we have done in the last 15 years. Okay. As the it's the story of how how Thomas Art changed uh, the culture from single-use plastic culture to uh, come back to a reusable stuff again. Global warming, climate change, plastic pollution are the result from human beings' acts. The disaster we are facing now are man-made disaster and it is about to stop before it is too late. We humankind need to change from destructive development to sustainable development. And one of the most important things is to stop using single plastic, especially the plastic big five, plastic bottles, plastic bags, plastic stores, plastic cups, and plus plastic utensils. Um, this is the goal that we aim to reduce. The solution, the best solution is coming back to the useful stuff. And the most successful and sustainable way is cultural sharing. And these are lessons learned at Thomasa University. Lesson one, not just campaign by hanging poster or giving mottos, but by setting conditions that change human behavior. 15 years ago, uh, we began to campaign to reduce uh, plastic shopping bag in the campus. We were the first university in Thailand that provided the freshmen the usable bag every year. But most of our students still, still, still take shopping bag, plastic shopping bag from the convenience stores because the convenience stores still give them the plastic bags. Therefore, we began a new measure, no more free plastic bag. It was in September 2015, and it works, but it's just only 30% that we can reduce. Therefore, we began a new measure. It was two years ago, as we banned completely plastic shopping bag in our campus. Only when the people buy edible stuff that warm or hot, they still can get some plastic bags. Only that. Listen to change the easiest things, then the more difficult things. Finish one and then step to the next. We began with to eliminate capsule. It is a successful story that we can eliminate because after that, it was applied nationwide in Thailand. And after that, that is what I show you, is the, the drinking water plastic cup for professors and teachers in class in classroom. We, we replace them with rewashable glass. And as we want to ban plastic cup in our canteens, we provide our reducible cups and then we can ban our plastic cup in the canteens. And then we go to next step is to ban plastic cup also out of the cafe in our university. And then we begin to ban plastic store and then to ban plastic utensil. Lesson three, do not begin to change by force, but by partnerships and motivation, then regulations, not in the opposite way. We talk to every stakeholder in our campus to the private companies, like big company like CP, uh, to all of the seller, retailers, and also we work not only in our campus, we work outside the campus. In the name of sustainable university network of Thailand, or in short name, Sun Thailand. Two years, three years ago, we ran a campaign, no plastic bag campaigns, and more than 30 universities in Thailand participated 
this campaign. We sign MOU with everybody, every sellers, every retailers, every shops in our campus to ban plastic shopping, uh, plastic, uh, plastic stocks, just single plastic stocks. And students, students are the most important stakeholder in the campus. We encourage them to run the project to stop using our plastic, single plastic. There are a lot of student projects in the last 10 years that the university support them. And everybody is the part of the university, not only professor, not only faculty members, not only students, but also security guards, uh, cleaning uh, ladies, everybody. You can see that our cleaning ladies, they also use, use the usable food container and usable mat. Lesson four, if we are host, we no need to ask, just change. And therefore, since three years, there are no single plastic anymore. In the meetings of university and events, we, we, we run and organize zero waste events. The picture I show you is a picture from the meeting of university housings. Since three years, there is no single plastic anymore. And the same by the other events in university. And lesson five, build and support a new lifestyle. And the most important thing, make it cool. These are marks, reusable marks we provided since five years. Year by year, we provide these reusable marks to the freshmen. And we install campus wide dispenser for drinking water to encourage the student to reduce up using of plastic bottles. And last year, we opened a very first refuse station in Thailand to encourage people, to inspire the people, to motivate the people to live without single plastic. Okay, and these are the staff in our refuse station, they are students. They sell something like this, reusable stuff, reusable cups, reusable food container, and so on. And I'm going to ask you why, why you, are, you are working here in the refuse station. Because I think it's good, and I want to be a part of serving our people. Yes, that is the answer from our staff. Thank you so much. And then, during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, even during this crisis, we are still working to reduce single plastic. Because in this crisis, there are more and more single plastic that is being used especially by food delivery. You, we stay at home, we order food, and we get more and more single plastic. At Thammasat Free Hospital, the first free hospital in Thailand, the highest amount of garbage is infected with. Day by day, a lot of infected waste that we have got from the patients, with 19 patients, and for the medical staff. Therefore, we replace uh, single-use PPE store with reusable PPE, shoe covers and masks. And they are doctors and nurses, our medical staff that work at the field hospital. I would like to all of your suit are uh, usable, right? Right, your PPE suit, your right. shoe cover and your best shoe. What? Why? In, in our field hospital, the, the people, the medical staff, need to wash the spoon and fork. Why are you willing to, to wash the uh, spoon and fork? In my opinion, I think not only we should be treat patient and their disease, but we should take care of the world and okay. our future. Okay. okay, they don't want only to kill the patient, COVID-19 patient, but also to kill our planet. Thank you so much.
But global warming is here to stay with action and not taken today. Thank you so much. Okay. And let's come back to the our slide. And second use plastic for food, such as plastic utensil, food containers and bottles. Also, second use chopsticks have been replaced by usable stuff. As I talked to you, as I said, as I said, at the field hospital, the nurse, the doctor need to wash the utensil, need to wash the dish at the field hospital. And this is the food container. Uh, we replace the single-use plastic food container with the reusable food container in Thai style. Uh, and we install this sensor for drinking water and we provide all of our staff with the reusable water so that we encourage them to reduce using our plastic bottle. Let's make changes. Not just for ourselves, but for our children and for the future of human beings. And together we can. Okay, and I will want to show you Thomasat teams. Okay. Panisa Abun Kam, you know her? Hello. Hello. You know her? Okay, <laughs> and the president of Tamasa University Council. Thank you so much. And my team. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are so proud. Power. We are so proud. <laughs> really appreciate it. And we would like. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation by you and your team. Um, <laughs> wonderful. We're so impressed also um, for looking ahead on COVID-19 and in particular your reusable PPE um, and also using reusable um, things in the hospital. That is, um, that is inspiring. So as oh. you said, you were really helping think about how to change for future generations. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Well deserved. Um, so, bye bye. Um, next, we will present the Whole Systems Approach Award. This award recognizes a project that demonstrates how sustainable campus planning and management can be used to positively impact the campus community and its research activities, the educational mission of the institution, and increase community engagement on or off campus. It is my honor to present the 2020 Whole Systems Approach Award to Chalmers University of Technology and KTH Royal Institute of Technology. The award is accepted by M Maria Eubstrom, Sustainability Strategist at Chalmers University of Technology, and Christina Von Ulrich, um, who is Von Ulrich, who is actually also a um, advisory committee member of the ISCN, and she is the sustainability manager at the Royal Institute of Technology at KTH. Um, please enjoy their presentation, and I believe um, Nicola is going to do a video again first, um, but then you will enjoy their presentation on how the higher education sector in Sweden has banded together to create a groundbreaking climate framework. Maria and Christina will be joined by Frederick um, who is the Vice President of Utilization at Chalmers University of Technology, to answer questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, sorry to Prinya and the audience for not sharing the, the sound on the last video, but I'll make sure I do it on this one. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Frederick Horstedt, I'm one of the initiators of the Climate Framework, and I truly believe that we, higher education institutions, have a central role to play in the efforts to combat climate change. I'm Joran Finnveden, I'm one of the other initiators of the Climate Framework. The background for this work is the importance and the urgency of climate action. 
We have an important task to contribute through our teaching, research, and innovation activity, but we also need to contribute by reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our own operations in line with the rest of society. Here in Sweden, the higher education sector has together created a climate framework that serves as the basis for a climate strategy specific to each institution. The goal is to bring our institutions in line with national and international commitments, including the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degrees limit and Sweden's national target to become climate neutral by 2045. Actually, this work started over a discussion over a cup of coffee, but we soon realized that we needed to involve the whole sector. So we started a collaboration with other Swedish universities, and in the end, all 37 presidents of higher education institutions signed the climate framework. The aim is to reduce emissions from the higher education institutions in Sweden, but also to make sure that we integrate climate action in education and research as well. Each institution chooses their focus areas depending on their local circumstances, and every institution is prepared to work with the following areas. Education, research, collaboration, business travel and energy usage. The foundation of the climate framework is the shared belief that a sustainable future is better achieved working collectively. That's how we engage and tackle the challenges to make our sector sustainable. The SHARE framework includes, but also extends beyond local projects and initiatives. That is to deploy implementation of climate targets across a breadth of Swedish institutions. An important aspect of the climate framework is the follow-up. So every higher education institution must allocate resources to also do a follow-up. The climate framework consists of a clear and simple commitment. And then we have developed a guideline document that identifies key areas for climate impact of the institutions. We who have signed the climate framework, we are familiar with the challenges of coping with climate change. We believe that we tackle them best together and in collaboration. All 37 institutions that have currently signed have provided their certain contributions to the framework its content and future possibilities. We hope that the climate framework can be an inspiration for higher education institutions in other countries, as well as networks and organizations. If you want to read more about the climate framework, there is more information available here. So over to you, Maria and Christina. Hello, thank you very much and for the nice introduction. And I, I think that Christina will present a, a slideshow here. Well, I start speaking while she tried to get uh, techniques together. Uh, first, from all 37 universities, we would like to thank you for this award. It is with great honor and pride that me and Christina represent all these universities at this digital ISCN award. And also that we have the opportunity to present the climate framework and hopefully inspire our universities to structured and strategic climate work. Thank you. I think it will come now. I'm working with it. So just wait a minute and we will have the presentation. Can you see it now? Okay. Yes, you have to put it in present mode. Yeah, like this. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Christina van Ørresh and I'm working as the Sustainability Manager at KTH. And of course, on behalf of the universities in Sweden who have signed this climate framework, we want to thank for this award. And of course, we are very happy and very proud uh, to have this award and we I think this will remind us of the importance to walk hand in hand with these important issues, what we are trying to do. And one driver for this climate framework was that we know that we need to accelerate the work and to contribute to the necessary trans transformation to a more sustainable society. 
So we hope really that this initiative can be spread to other countries and also for accelerating the work. And of course, we think together we are stronger. And uh, as a background, um, the higher education sector in Sweden has created a climate framework, as you heard before, to serve as the basis for climate strategics at individual higher education institutions. And the climate framework is the product of 37 higher education institutions in Sweden with the aim to contribute to both national and the international commitments to reach the, the goal. And this is a unique nationwide initiative uh, as we are bringing the sector in a country together with a common aim. So the background to the climate framework, well, you know, are uh, acquainted with the IPCC one and a half uh, target. And now, of course, uh, the university has a special role and responsibility as a, st a social stakeholder, and we must work together with the society. Katie Eich and uh, Charles initiated this climate framework, but all 37 uh, universities have contributed. There have been discussions and work together with researchers and also other key roles at the universities. From the beginning, we pinpointed the very uh, in most important thing that is the to, to, to that management responsibility in this climate work. And therefore, all presidents at the 37 universities have actually been the one that signed their, that, that they apply to this frame. We have noticed that it has been a very great national and international interest, and uh, that is great. Yes, thank you. And then, what have you then promised when we have signed up this climate framework? Uh, we will, through education, research, and external engagement, help the society as a whole to achieve set targets. And we will also reduce our own climate impact in line with the society's commitment as expressed in national and international agreements. Of course, this is a base for us. And we will also based on our high, higher education specific condition for each university, set up far reaching targets for climate related work and also allocate the necessary resources so that we can achieve these targets. And also it's important, of course, to conduct following ups. And we will also clearly communicate our climate related work in order to inspire and spread knowledge to other organizations and the member of the society. So the content of the climate framework actually connected to the climate framework, there are the guidelines. The guidelines can be used for the universities to, to, to have inspiration of which activities they can have. The, pu the purpose is to reduce our ne uh, direct negative climate impact and at the same time increase our indirect positive climate impact. The gu guidelines contain 13 areas of these inspirations to, to, for the universities to uh, have activities in line with the 1.5 degree target. Although five uh, or actually six of these areas are mandatory there, it is business trips, energy consumption, education, research, external engagements, and students. And in all these areas, we have to show improvements and uh, also have uh, uh, the responsibility to actually show the in, 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 in improvements. Yes, and then the most important thing is how should we then implement the climate frame, framework in our organization at the universities? And it's very important to develop a clear strategic goal for reducing the climate impact and also allocate the necessary resources for this work and also to implement measures and also report the results of climate related work in the organization in different levels both internally and externally, and also demonstrate systematical goal-oriented work 
that you need to have a platform for this work that is integrated in the management of the university. And also report measurable effects and achieved results and really show how you improve the work and how it can benefit the organization. And to add to this, of course, it's always uh, to work hard and also to be a little bit stubborn when you're doing this work. Uh, it's important to be re responsive and also to anchor this work in the organization because the goal in some way is to that everyone should have the possibility to work with these issues in the different level in the organization. It should be for everyone and you need to create that approach. And then of course, to mainstreaming in the business processes at the university, this work. So it will be a, a daily work for the staff. The main results and effects that we hope for, of course then, to be in line with the 1.5 degree uh, target. And by that also show that we have a 50% uh, reduction to 2030. So the problem is how to go to zero to 2045. And I actually see one of the questions here in the questions and answers um, chat. Chalmers and KTH, what challenges do you face when developing the common climate framework? Well, actually this is one challenge, how to really reach zero by 2045. What we hope for is that the compensation is uh, uh, by the research and the utilization of the research and also the knowledge and inspiration we hopefully give to the students. Yes, and what is the next step for us in Sweden then? Uh, we will have a sustainability network meeting for the Swedish universities in the beginning of June and then we will discuss how we are working with the uh, implementation of the climate frame framework. It's very important to see how the other universities have developed their own climate strategies and how they put up targets and what kind of measures, very concrete measures that they would like to happen. And then we already have had a following up meeting two days ago. It was Schalmer who hosted that meeting. It was for the Swedish universities, but of course we invited other universities that uh, participate uh, took part in, in this event. And then we discussed how, how the work is going on and we did also a survey for that. So it's happening very good things and we need really to come together. And then we also have a forum for the presidents from the universities on a national level and they have their meetings and they will also discuss um, the climate issue and how on a strategic level they can push this forward. And then uh, we also want the climate framework, of course, to go in a national and that we can inspire others. So we have also in the, in the Nordic network discussed this framework and how we can work together in, order, in the Nordic countries. And then we also have worked with this in different uh, networks that we attend. So that was just one example. And uh, if you have some questions, just uh, contact, contact us. We should be very happy because we are working with this and we need also experience uh, from other universities and how we really can implement this and, and make it happen. I see here, Christina, that we have a question of the challenges that we see in, in the future. Yeah. And if I may answer that one, um, uh, for instance, the, the, the COVID situation, of course, but, but uh, also the, the main thing is here to really allocate the resources and, and, and for the management to pinpoint the responsibility for, for take actions. Now, one year has soon, uh, it was like one year ago that we, uh, we, the framework were uh, published. So, so now it's the time for, for show the results. And that's why we had this follow-up workshop for this Tuesday. Thank you so much, Maria and Christina. That was wonderful. That is such an incredible model. Um, and we look forward to, to hearing more about what you accomplished and how um, you know, your work, again, can inspire all of us globally. So that was really terrific. Um, Nicola reminded me that we'll be taking questions from all of the winners at the end. 
Um, and so that we, we hope to, to get all of those answered for you then. The other thing I wanted to say is that all of the videos from today, as well as your presentations, will be put on the ISCN website for all of the winners and also the second runner-ups, the finalists. So all finalists um, will again have their presentations and videos put up on the ISCN website so people can go back and look at those. Um, so with that, on, on behalf of the group, um, Christina and Maria, that was incredible presentation um, and you know just an incredible model and we're really looking forward, I think, to hear um, the continuation and also to answer some questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for all the universities in Sweden. <laughs> it's wonderful. We're always looking to our Scandinavian colleagues who are um, you know, doing incredible work. So um, with that, I also now move to the next award, which is the 2020 Partnerships for Progress. And this goes to LUT University. Um, please join me in welcoming um, Kati Koikalinen, um, coordinator for L LUT Junior University, and to accept the award. Um, and so I will, I believe, turn it back over for a video, and then we will go to Kati. That's correct. Okay, Kathy, it's over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Nicola. And hello to everyone, and greetings from Finland. First, I want to thank for the award. This really means a lot to our university, and I think it also means a lot to the city of Lappeenranta. So next, I will try and do I put my presentation on just to wait a second. And Nicola, do you see it now rightly? Yes, perfect. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So let's move on. 
First, um, a couple of words about our university. Uh, we have two campuses in two cities, at Lappeenranta and Lahti. Lahti is European green capital for 2021, and now Lappeenranta is a European green leaf finalist for the same year. And today uh, I will concentrate to our uh, cooperation with the city of Lappeenranta. Let's skip a little bit because I know this we are running out of time. Our university's strategy is called Trailblazers. It means that we are seeking solutions to clean energy, clean water, circular economy and sustainable business. And these are also the key topics which we teach to local GITs through our junior university concept. Our university has done some cooperation with different school levels about 20 years now, but uh, a couple of years ago we decided together with the city of Lappeenranta to create a unique educational concept which involves many different age groups in our town. And our vision is already made for the year 2028. Firstly, we want our city to be well known of the high level know-how all the way from the preschool to the university level. And secondly, we want that our children to be interested in science, technology, research and sustainable business so that they will have good possibilities to build a sustainable future. Then thirdly, we want that our high school students have the best knowledge and skills for academic studies in Finland. And next, you will get to know how we collaborate with the schools. We really believe that our concept is something unique because, firstly, every child participates in our teaching activities, and at the same time, they all get the possibility to get the no LUT university. And everything, including the planning and also implementing, is done in very close cooperation with school teachers and university researchers. All the learning activities are included in the local curriculums, and we really have a strong support from the heads of the city. The junior university is one of the top highlights of our city's strategy. And this is not the project. We are committed to this cooperation for now on. Every year, 400 preschoolers, 2,100 school children, and about 1,000 high school students participate in our annual activities. Children involved in our cooperation are at age between about 6 to 18. And in addition to this, over 100 experts and about 150 teachers take part in organizing, planning, implementing and developing the actions. And next, I will tell you through the pictures what we teach and how we teach. First, preschoolers. For preschoolers, the topics are clean water, clean energy, and circular economy. For preschool teachers, we offer different kinds of teaching materials and research equipments, like consumption meters for water and for electricity. Material for teaching the recycling is prepared together with the local waste handling company. And also together we have trained all the preschool teachers to use these materials in their own teaching activities. Then third graders, it's uh, about um, nine to 10 years old. And the topics are clean water and circular economy. Together with the local environmental office, we organize 
expert driven clean water days in every primary school. We have about 20 primary schools here in our city. The first lesson is about natural water cycle. At the same lesson, children also get to know all the eco labels, for example, and they learn how to protect our lake, Lake Saima. The second lesson for the third graders is about wastewater. What it is, where does it go, how it is cleaned, and why it is important to know what you are allowed to put in the toilet and whatnot. Kids also learn what all of us can do to minimize the water consumption. The second topic for third graders is circular economy. Together again with the local waste handling company, we have made teaching material for this topic. The material boxes are distributed to all schools and teachers are trained to use this. Is somebody's microphone on now? I can hear something. Then let's move to the fifth graders. Uh, pupils are about 11 to 12 years old and the topic is sustainable business. All fifth graders, they build up their own little enterprises with the help of their own teacher. Uh, they learn how uh, sustainable development should be taken into account uh, during the planning, planning process and also when running a company. And in April, every fifth graders attend so-called Lutra Festival at our university, at LUT University. At this festival, we also select the little enterprise of the year in La Peranta and the same little enterprise will be nominated to the national finals too. Then next, move to the eighth graders. All the eighth graders visit our university too. At schools, they have this multidisciplinary project work called Sustainable Living and Clean Energy. Our university and some of our partners organize workshops for eighth graders from many, many different topics, as you can see from the slide. And at the moment, we are building up the same kind of cooperation with local and some national high schools. With high schools, we organize example visiting lectures, different kind of intensive days and workshops, and also some courses together. And every year, thousands of high school students visit our university. The junior university concept is one way to ensure that our city will become more sustainable year by year. We educate our kids and youngsters to be active citizens who really have adopted a sustainable lifestyle and who are at the forefront of solving the world's sustainability challenges. These are ensured by bringing the LUT University's expertise local schools and of course we also hope that as many young people as possible will continue their studies at university level. I'm very happy to give you more information so please do not hesitate to contact me and thank you for this award and for your attention. Thank you. Ati, thank you so much. That was inspiring. Um, also adorable to see the preschoolers um, actively learning about um, circular economy and clean energy and clean water. Um, what a wonderful program that you have created. Um, Thank you. And I know that we'll have questions at the end and, and as you say, um, really look forward to staying in touch and, and learning more. Um, makes me want to, to, to come bring my daughter to Finland. So thank yeah, you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you.
So our last award um, today is the Honorary Member Award, and it's granted to an institution that is not a member of the ISCN, but we very much hope will become a member of the ISCN, I must say, as a co-chair of the advisory committee. Um, and they have really demonstrated their commitment to the guiding principles of the ISCN. The Honorary Member Award is granted also one free year of membership. So we look forward to you getting to know us and us getting to know you better over the next year. Um, so it is my honor to present the 2020 Honorary Member Award to McGill University. The award will be accepted by Francois Miller, Sustainability Director for McGill Office of Sustainability at the University, and for their Vision 2020 Climate and Sustainability Action Plan. Please enjoy this presentation, again, the video on McGill's um, University Vision 2020 Climate and Sustainability Action Plan, and the presentation by Francois. 45 concrete deliverables, 22 priority actions, five categories, two goals, and one vision. En 2007, après un processus de consultation de deux ans, l'Université McGill a publié son plan d'action Vision 2020, la deuxième stratégie de développement durable de notre institution, et la première à s'attaquer au changement climatique. A collaborative and representative plan for and from the McGill community. Vision 2020 a établi des activités concrètes pour réduire l'empreinte carbone de McGill et soutenir les initiatives de durabilité sur le campus. De plus, notre plan d'action définit comment nous atteindrons la carboneutralité d'ici 2040. Nearing the end of its implementation, this action plan has been the catalyst for initiatives such as the Sustainable Vehicle Management Program, the phase out of plastic water bottles on campus, and the appointment of McGill's first climate officer. Avec un campus principal au cœur du centre-ville de Montréal et des campus satellites autour, l'impact de Vision 2020 a résonné dans toute la région et ouvre la voie à l'avenir de la durabilité et de l'action climatique à McGill. So over to you, Francois. Okay, hi everyone. I'll just start by sharing my screen here. Okay. Uh. All right, so uh, again, hi everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm really glad to be here, and I'd like to start by congratulating the uh, uh, the other uh, winners and finalists in all the category. And I want to give a special uh, shout out to the people from the McGill Office of uh, Sustainability who are watching this uh, right now. So a few words about uh, uh, McGill. Uh, we're a campus that's almost 200 uh, years old. We have roughly 40,000 uh, students and we're located in uh, Montreal uh, in Canada. And one of the features uh, of our university is that we have a central campus downtown, but we also operate a farm uh, on the west of the uh, island uh, of Montreal. So in the next few minutes, I'll uh, provide a brief overview of uh, Vision 2020. So for our university, this document really provide a strategic framework to tackle, or uh, I should say to take climate and sustainability actions really to the uh, next level. And throughout the development of this uh, strategy, we always try to walk that fine line between ambitious and realism. So uh, maybe if uh, some of you who are involved in sustainability offices who are listening can uh, uh, relate to that, uh, to that tension, I guess. One of the distinguishing elements of Vision 2020 is the effort that we've put in community uh, consultation. And we really made a conscious effort to reach out to both students, staff, and uh, faculty members throughout the university. 
so in total, we uh, uh, were able to connect it, uh, to connect with uh, more than 500 community members through all sorts of uh, consultation uh, events. We, uh, our strategy, as you saw in the video, uh, um, is comprised of two long-term uh, goals. The first one is to achieve a platinum sustainability rating by 2030 using uh, STARS. And the uh, second target is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2040. This, this one especially is quite ambitious since we also include what are called scope three emissions um, so scope three emissions are indirect emissions coming from mainly uh, air travel and uh, commuting so, um, uh, so that's what we're aiming for so with for, to get us closer to these two long-term goals we've identified 22 priority actions that are spread out through five categories and there are um, uh, 45 really specific deliverables associated to each action that we uh, aim to accomplish by the end of 2020 and taken all together those elements make up for mcgill's sustainability uh, vision so uh, we obviously track really uh, uh, continuously the implementation of our uh, of all the deliverables and our progression toward our long-term targets. So what you see here is an extract from from our midway progress report, which shows that uh, on average, uh, when we were at uh, uh, at the middle of 2018, uh, close to 70 percent of all the deliverables had been implemented, and we're obviously looking to have to be at the 100 percent by the end of uh, 2020. So, to make it more concrete, uh, we're uh, we're just showcasing here quickly some of the actions that were enabled by uh, uh, Vision 2020. So first we implemented a sustainable management, a vehicle management uh, program to ensure that every new vehicle coming into our fleet has to be either electric or hybrid. We also appointed McGill's first climate officer, which is part uh, uh, of our office and supports us in our journey towards carbon neutrality. And uh, Miguel also created a research sustainability hub. So it's called the Miguel Sustainability Systems Initiatives, which provides support and funding for uh, Miguel sustainability researchers. So as we're nearing the end of our journey for Vision 2020, we look forward to uh, uh, to the future. We're now in the process, in the, the consultation process for our next strategy, which obviously moved uh, uh, online, but we still managed to engage quite uh, uh, quite a lot with our community despite the uh, social distancing. So to conclude, uh, I'd like to thank again ISCN for the award. I wish everyone uh, well, and we're uh, also leaving you with uh, one final question through the, through the poll that uh, is framed around hope. So we were uh, wondering what inspires you the most about the world's sustainable future, and you will probably notice that we didn't include a, ch uh, a choice at the end which says none of the above. <laughs> so we're uh, just wondering what uh, uh, what we're going through collectively, uh, 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 even though it's a, a difficult situation, kind of inspires you for how we can build a better future. So that's it for me. Okay, so the, the answers are flooding in. I'll leave it open for another 10 seconds and then we'll see what the res um, results are.
Okay, interesting. The, the, it's pretty wide uh, uh, system. There's answers pretty much everywhere. So, uh, system, I fe we felt it would be uh, neat to, uh, since we're the last presenter, to close with uh, a note of uh, hope. <laughs> Thank you so much, Francois. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we're looking forward to, to um, again, going to Q&A with you and, and the other winners. But thank you to Miguel. It's exciting to see how much progress you've made. And we'll be interested to see, um, we too are looking at our post-2020 planning now and, and see where you head next after doing such a wonderful job of um, completing the goals you, the ambitious goals you set forward for yourself. So thank you so much. And thank you for that nice poll. I, I do think um, the social sustainability and improving well-being obviously is especially on people's minds today. And so hopefully we can continue to capture that as an end goal to advancing sustainable development and addressing climate change. So thank you so much. My pleasure. So now um, I think Nicola and I will move to the Q&A. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes. Um, there are um, some questions already in the Q&A that we can begin to ask. Um, I also do just want to say on a sort of fun note um, that each of the award winners um, and presenters will be getting a B Hotel, which I'm so intrigued by, um, that you can install on your campus and a wooden commemorative plaque, um, plaque rather. So you'll be getting those plaques, I assume, in the mail. So, so on to questions. Um, let me just start out here. Let's see. Um, so the first question is for um, Chalmers and KTH in Sweden. Um, which forums did you use to develop the common climate framework? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we were using first internally uh, the whole organization uh, we involved all the staff in this work. For us, it was very important to invite everyone so they felt that they took part in this process. And then, of course, we also have uh, uh, worked hard with the manager at different levels in the organization to make this happen and have their suggestion and understanding what we should prioritize in this work. That was also very important. And then we also, at the workshops we had, we invited uh, the stakeholders like our landlords, we don't own our buildings, we rent them. And, and also other, uh, of course, um, important stakeholders that have a connection to these climate goals. So we have worked very hard to have our own uh, also um, strategic climate work. So that was one way to discuss the climate framework and what we should do. And then, of course, the process was to involve students. Uh, in a national level, uh, we have students organization for climate issues and also at the universities, they were invited as so we have meeting with them. And then also this important board on the national level where we have the, the, the presidents coming together to discuss different kinds of issues. And this is one is issues. So students, uh, important stakeholders, and also of course internally we worked with this issue. And then we have the very important network that have been running for a long time. And that network is the network for uh, environmental management system and how the universities are working with that. That have been a base to, to send around drafts and so on because it's in that group. You have the sustainability manager and environmental manager at each university who know how they should handle also this climate framework internally. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, now I have a question for um, Francois and Miguel from Tina. Uh, it says, thanks also for your contribution. Uh, which elements of scope three emissions do you include? Is it only air travel and food or could you share a full scope three analysis? Okay, thanks for the, the question. Uh, we include a few things in our scope three emissions, but the most uh, the, the two main ones are uh, air travel, which accounts for 
uh, roughly 14% of our total uh, carbon footprint. So in, in absolute numbers, it's around uh, 8,000 tons of uh, CO2 emissions that's uh, uh, related to air travel. That was obviously uh, for our 2018 uh, greenhouse gas inventory will probably change dramatically when we'll do our 2020 uh, GHG inventory. Uh, and again, in 2018, our second uh, uh, largest source of emission in scope three was uh, commuting, which is a little bit less than air travel, but almost the same. Uh, so around 12% uh, of our uh, total uh, carbon footprint. So around uh, a little over 7,000 tons of CO2 emission through uh, commuting. Thank you. Um, and uh, Prinya, uh, could you maybe answer the question that was posed? Uh, people are very interested in, um, especially with COVID, the fact that you've been able to use reusable containers and that there have been questions at other places, universities, um, that, the, that they may be contaminated. So could you maybe speak to how you have um, tackled that challenge of making sure that you can actually use reusable containers? And you're on mute. Adam, uh, my last, uh, the way last uh, die when we wash, you know, with the, Wash, washing stuff, you know. Uh, before I we begin this measure about uh, usable food containers, usable uh, utensil, we talk to and we, we we make a meeting with the doctors and medical staff, and we are sure that it's no problem because you know, uh, as you heard, maybe you have heard. Uh, a case in from USA, a lady uh, they lock, locked down at home for 19 days, never get out to see anyone, but but uh, she got uh, uh, the COVID-19, you know, from the food delivery, from the uh, thing, from the uh, plastic uh, bag, from the food delivery, you know. But if we wash, you know, uh, the stuff, it's no problem. I mean, with the washing stuff, the the washing stuff kill, you know, kill the virus. It's no problem because this is not not just uh, you know both are important. Not just about how to protect the people from COVID nineteen, but also in the same time. We can protect the world at the same time. We can use, we can reach the goals together in the same time. And this is not uh, only from the from from myself, but it is measure that we talk to the our hospital, our medical staff, and therefore we are the first a few hospital that we use usable food containers. And I am, you know, at the beginning it was for me is is a challenge, you know. How can you motivate the doctor to wash the, 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 the utensil? How can you motivate them to wash the dish and so on? But they are willing you know, to do this. As a doctor, the doctor that presents himself here, answer me my question. Yes. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and now, um, Kati, could you answer um, sort of two-part question. One is, um, how have you been able to measure the learning outcomes of your curriculum and the impact they're having? And um, also, how have you, how did you forge that public-private partnership? Because it, you know, not only did you draw on the resources of the university, but it, it sounds like you also work with local governments and businesses. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first, about those uh, outcomes. Uh, this academic year was the first year when we operated the whole program from the beginning to the end for the every age group. So that's why we do not have any outcomes yet. We will see those after year by year. 
and maybe it takes many, many years, many t maybe 10 years. But um, we have been um, making questionnaire for uh, ninth graders last year. There is uh, some questions about how they think about the sustainability issues and these kind of things. And we are preparing the questionnaire every year. So that's how we get feedback. And of course, uh, in the schools, the teachers, uh, they are the one measuring how the kids learn. Uh, because these are in the curriculum. So we, as a university, we don't uh, measure as much. We, of course, have uh, been focusing on seeing if this has some kind of affection, how many um, applicants from our own city will come to our own university as a university perspective. And then uh, our university, we have always done a lot of cooperation with uh, industry and enterprises and with the city because we are quite a small university and the city is not a large one. Uh, it's so uh, easy to do a cooperation. And the whole junior university concept started so that um, there was a couple of um, managers from our university and also a couple of managers from the city side. And they visited together some universities in the Europe to see how the Europe universities cooperate, so that university and the city, how they cooperate together. And during that visit, uh, these bosses, they get the idea that we have to build something together. And when the city manager said that this is really great, <laughs> we have to focus on this and we have to find money for this, <laughs> And then they put it the, the, the strategy, and it is uh, the one key um, key issue how we really have managed to build this large cooperation only in a couple of years, because uh, the city put a lot of money uh, so that we can get teachers out out of their normal work to develop this together with the university. And of course, our university put uh, its own resources. For example, me as a coordinating this uh, cooperation, I'm a full-time worker, 100% only doing this. And university is paying my salary. And also university gives some, um, some hours from uh, researchers to put their expertise to this cooperation also. Wonderful, thank you so much. I think we have one minute and we're gonna end um, by putting up a quick poll um, that I think um, Chalmers and KTH uh, in Sweden just uh, gave to us. And hopefully just like Francois's poll, it will be very inspiring. Um, so we will let people um, weigh in here and then I will turn it back to Nicola um, so while you're taking the poll, I'll just say thank you and congratulations to all of the winners and also the impressive finalists um, who, who and others that submitted. Um, in, it was a very competitive process um, and we really are appreciative of all the incredible work you're doing um, and the fact that you're connected to ISCM so we can all learn and benefit from it and partner together. So with that, Let's see, do you, Nicola, do we have the results? You should be able to see them now. Sorry, we can't hear you, Christina. Christina, you're on mute. Do you want to say something? Thank you so much. This is a terrific results. So we know what we have to do now. <laughs> just to work harder and really work together and sharing experience. So thank you for this poll. So we have this understanding. And thank you also for this event. This has been great organized. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, um, Nicola and Sylvia and Victoria and team. This has been a really great event. I agree. Um, and I think that's a perfect way to end, right, Nicola? Absolutely. Uh, now we are inspired. We need to do an international collaboration um, following what Sweden is doing. Anything else, Nicola? 
Well, from my side, I want to thank you, Heather, and all of the awardees and presenters for today. Um, I think it's been an excellent event. And thank you for taking the time and um, dealing with the technical glitches, which always come when you're working with webinars. <laughs> um, and I also would like to make a mention of the um, finalists, the second place finalists for the ISCN award um, awards. So second place for the Whole Systems Award, um, Whole Systems Approach Award with Stellenbosch University from South Africa. Second place for the Partnership for Progress Award with the Universidad Católica Lumen Genutium. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, um, but they're based in Mexico and they were partnered with Yale and MIT. The Cultural Change for Sustainability Award in second place was ETH Zurich, so here in Switzerland. Um, and the second honorary member award went to University of Lausanne. And just a final, final notes before we finish off. Um, we have, th this is the first in a series of um, virtual events that ISCN will be hosting. So we have the student engagement um, for sustainability on, on the campus events on the 28th of May. And that will be student led, but open to everyone. So we really hope to see you there on the 28th of May. So thanks again to everyone. I hope you have a good afternoon, day, evening. Thank you, Nicola, for doing all the hard work on this. More than welcome. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations. Thank you.